This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 18. 1 Samuel 18 through 20, David's persecution. God has called forth a new king for Israel. Saul, God's first choice and Israel's first king, has been unfaithful. He has preferred his own way instead of God's way, does what he wants instead of what God wants. And God says, I have chosen a better man. And so he has Samuel secretly anoint young David, probably about 14 years of age at that time, to be the king of Israel. Well, God brings David into Saul's experience. David kills the giant Goliath and brings forth a great victory over the Philistines. And Saul has a demonic spirit that troubles him, a spirit sent by the Lord. And so God brings forth David to play the harp and to sing and to soothe Saul and drive that demonic spirit away. That teaches something about how to overcome demonic activities and depression in our lives. Praise. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Well, David is very successful. We're going to see that as he rises in popularity and in accomplishments, Saul is going to be jealous and even try to kill David. We're going to see persecution. We're going to see a promise that's going to take a long time to be fulfilled. A promise that David will be king over Israel. And it's going to take 21 years to accomplish it. 21 long, persecuted, difficult years. So when God gives you a promise, hold on. It might not be easy, but God will fulfill his word. The year is 1014 BC, over 3,000 years ago. We're going to see how Saul resents David, how he begins to persecute David in chapter 19, and then how Saul's son, Jonathan, loves David and supports him, even in David's time of persecution. As always, let's get God's help. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to really understand it and totally to be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 18, let's look at David receiving praise because of that great victory over Goliath. Jealousy arising in the heart of Saul and David marrying Saul's daughter, Michal, and continually inspiring fear in Saul because of his great accomplishments and inspiring love in the people because of his valor and ability to lead. I think the lesson for chapter 18 is our godly conduct will cause fear in some and love in others. So chapter 18, we've seen this great victory now over Goliath in the preceding chapter. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So the son of Saul is a young man named Jonathan. Jonathan is the heir apparent to the throne. If Saul were to continue on as king, and his line were to continue, then Jonathan would be the next king. But Jonathan loves David, senses in David God's hand of anointing, and we'll see shortly uh, in another couple of chapters that he knows that he, Jonathan, will not be the king, but David will. I think of all the characters and all the people we find in the Bible, I would have to think long and hard before I found somebody that I think is as admirable as Jonathan. You're going to see such love, such selflessness, such devotion, such purity that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, offhand, honestly, nobody comes to this little mind of mine to compare with this man. And I have to say personally, when I get to heaven and I have a chance to say hi to Jesus, and sit down and see mom and dad and my brother and a few others, I think the very first person I want to see from Bible history is Jonathan. I think that much of him. 
And standing next to David, we are going to see the purity uh, of this man and the power of this man. David is God's chosen man. He's anointed. He's going to be the great psalmist. But you're going to see a lot of admixture with David. You're going to see purity. You're going to see deception. You're going to see love. You're going to see some actions that are going to be absolutely outrageous, such as murdering the wife or the, the husband of uh, the woman he lays with, Bathsheba's husband Uriah. But again, God has chosen David. He is a powerful man of God. But look at the purity of Jonathan. Jonathan has a small part to play, but what a great part he has. And what a great part he has to play in David's life at a very crucial time when he needs Jonathan's support. My prayer would be that I might be a Jonathan to somebody. Perhaps you'd like to be as well. Verse 2, Saul took him that day, meaning David, and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. So Jonathan loved David even as he loved his own soul, without any sense of self. There have been people who've tried to make something homosexual out of that, but that's not the case at all. There's no indication in Scripture there's any homosexual relationship here. There can be a deep love for one man for another, one woman for another, as long as it's not in the sexual sense. And we see that kind of a deep covenant love here. Jonathan and David made a covenant. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. He gave him everything that he really had. His robe symbolizing that he was the heir apparent to the throne. And the bow and the belt necessary for hunting and for survival. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So we're going to see how David is going to be used by God to rise higher and higher. Now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that means Goliath, that the, the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So there's a great celebration now that they're coming back from this historic and wonderful victory over the Philistines after young David had felled the giant Goliath. So the women sang as they danced, and they said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward, or he viewed with suspicion young David. Jealousy is a horrible, horrible emotion. We've all experienced it in one form or another. It's been called the green-eyed monster, and it's the subject of many plays such as Othello by Shakespeare. And it's a horrible, horrible thing to have happen. When you are jealous of somebody else and it spoils your joy, you can't see that person with love, you can't pray for that person. It can be somebody in your family, it can be somebody in competition, it, the workplace, it can be someone in ministry around the corner. And what sad consequences come from that kind of jealousy. There's no peace, there's no purity, there's no power. When you and I are locked into jealousy, we're really blocking the flow of God in our lives. We're going to see that as the jealousy that Saul has toward David grows. So his power diminishes, the Holy Spirit leaves Saul, in fact has already left him, and now a troubling demonic spirit is constantly troubling him. And if you and I are struggling with jealousy, we need to confess it, ask God to forgive us, and really, really work on that area, largely through being grateful for what we have. One of the commandments is, thou shalt not covet. The Apostle Paul talked about that, and my take is that Paul suffered from that jealousy, and that's what covetousness is, isn't it? You're desiring something that somebody else has, and so it becomes truly a matter of covetousness 
Uh, I want what he has. And here's a great victory. The people are celebrating Saul's victory, but he's getting the credit for thousands falling. David has 10,000s falling. We're going to find in life that no matter what we achieve, somebody always has what we think is more or better. Oh, we can strive for more money, uh, newer cars, better home, bigger this, better that. But there's always somebody who has more. And if we have that jealous nature, we're never satisfied. Never satisfied. Once the fabulously wealthy John D. Rockefeller was asked, Mr. Rockefeller, with all of your billions of dollars, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. And that's not that he was jealous, but he was telling the truth. You always want more, but to be content. Again, the Apostle Paul said, you know, I've been abased and I've abounded. I've been down, I've been up, but I've learned in whatever circumstance I find myself to be content to be content. My late mother used to say when I would complain about something, be careful, honey, lest a fate worse than this befall you. It could be worse. Be grateful, knock off the complaining, knock off the jealousy. Well, Saul's not going to do that. Verse 10, it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. So here's this troubling spirit. It's being sent by God to trouble Saul because Saul is not looking to God, he's looking to Saul, trying to protect what he has, trying to meet his own needs instead of letting God meet his needs for him. So here's this distressing spirit, and he prophesied inside the house. So this um, distressing spirit is causing him to prophesy, no doubt a very negative prophecy. So David, remember David's job is to play the harp and to minister music. And incidentally, this young David, as he is ministering, no doubt learned to play the harp somewhere uh, out in the field taking care of the sheep. He's not only ministering to Saul, but he is observing the office of kingship, which he will assume one day. And he's also learning how to praise God. He's learning the power of praise, how praise can be used in warfare against the enemy, especially demonic activities. And of course, he'll become the author of the wonderful Psalms for most of the Psalms that we enjoy out of the 150 that we find in our Bible. So David played music with his hand as at other times. He thought everything was gonna be normal today, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. So when you've got a distressing spirit and you've got a spear in your hand, look out. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. So now Saul is afraid of David. He knows that God is with David. He knows also really that David is going to replace him as king. And so he wants to kill him. He wants to hold on to what he has. And that's a tendency we have as we move in the flesh to hold on to what we have instead of letting God take care of it. Lord, as Job said, you give and you take away. Blessed be the Lord. The late Corey Ten Boom wisely said, don't hold on to the things of this world too tightly because it's going to hurt when God takes them out of your hand. That goes for people, positions, power, money. If God gave it, Open your hand. If he wants you to keep it, you'll keep it. If he doesn't want you to keep it, you don't want it anyway. And so here he's holding on and he's angry. And so what does he do to David? He demotes him. Here David has been right there in the court room or the court of this, man, this king. And now he's being demoted to just take care of a thousand men out there in the field. But what does David do? When he's demoted, he is not angry. 
He is not derelict in his duty. He is behaving wisely. Maybe you or I will face a demotion. Probably in some way we're going to be demoted in some fashion before we pass away. Maybe on the job, maybe as we get older we have fewer responsibilities or we retire or what have you. But we have less today than we did yesterday. Are we still grateful? Are we still behaving wisely? Or are we angry and sullen and not doing the work properly? David is going to continue to do his work faithfully, whether it's much or little. And now it's comparatively little. But while Saul hates David, and David seems to be somewhat demoted, in the eyes of the people, he's rising higher and higher. They see how he is leading them wisely, and God is preparing their hearts so that he will be able to lead them effectively. I think one of the prayers we ought to pray, whether it's in our families, whether it's at work or in ministry, is, Lord, give me favor in the eyes of those with whom I come in contact. It can be just somebody casually at the gas station or someplace else. Give me favor. Not for my sake, my reputation, my good, but for the glory of God. To make the way easier. I don't want to go into a place and say, I'm a Christian and they're going to persecute me and you're potentially my enemies. And so I'm going to be calling down fire upon you in prayer. But Lord, let the love of Jesus Christ flow through my life. And may I show that love to all with whom I come in contact. Give me favor, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Well, verse 17. Saul said to David, remember Saul had made a promise that whoever felled, whoever killed Goliath would marry his daughter. He'd also be exempt from taxes. Well, it's coming time now for payment. And David is the one who killed Goliath. He is entitled to marry the king's daughter. So, verse 17, Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter Merab. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, Let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So he knows he has to fulfill his promise. So he has the older daughter Merab and says, David, here she is. And I want you to be valiant. But you're going to have to do something for this. Now, there was no condition before except to kill Goliath. Now there's a condition. And so here's the condition. Verse 18, David said to Saul, uh, Who am I and what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? David has such love for Saul and such respect for the office. He thinks I'm not worthy to be in this family. But it happened at that time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David that she was given to Adriel, the Mahalathite, as a wife. So for some reason, Saul just did not fulfill his promise and he gave Merab to somebody else. So we see again and again, Saul is not a man who is worthy, a man who can be trusted. Now Michal, the Saul, Saul's daughter, that's the younger daughter, loved David. And they told Saul and the thing pleased him. So Saul still needs to fulfill the promise of giving a daughter. And he understands that uh, his younger daughter, Michal, is uh, loving David. So Saul said, I will give her to him, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today. So same day, busy day, here's Merab, whoop, nope, I've given her to somebody else. Well, here's Michal, you can have her. Um, but his motive is not pure. He's not trying to honor and bless David for having killed Goliath. He wants to use his daughter, thinking he can control her and make David's life miserable. And he can put David's life to an end by the condition he's going to impose. Verse 22, Saul commanded his servants, communicate with David secretly and say, look, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servant spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am a poor and lightly esteemed man? And I think David's being honest there. I think he's being humble. 
And I think God wants to have us that way. If we have too much of a, a high opinion of ourselves, God can't really use us. The Bible says to esteem others more highly than ourselves. David doesn't see himself as a great person, even though he's very popular at this time. But he says, I am a poor and lightly esteemed man. And that's a good attitude for us to have. The natural man within us says, I'm basically maybe not the best in the world, but better than anybody I know. Smarter, better looking, this and that and what have you. And it's very difficult for us to esteem others more highly than ourselves. We're the smartest ones on the block. We're the this, we're that. And, and then we wonder why we're not being blessed by God and why we're not particularly popular among others. We get on the workforce and workplace and we work hard and we know in our hearts we're better than anybody else. We don't say anything to anybody else, but we're giving off that sense. I'm better than you are and you're incompetent. And sometimes by things we say and do, the message is very clear. Guess what? People are not really excited about that. So when I'm telling others by body language and what have you, I'm better than you, that's going to make them distance themselves from me and isolate me and I'll not be effective. So he says, uh, I'm lightly esteemed, I'm poor, I'm not deserving of this honor. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, in this manner David spoke. So Saul said, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Wow. There was no condition. There was no dowry before. The dowry condition was kill Goliath. Goliath's dead. Oh, and by the way, I want you to now kill 100 Philistines and bring their foreskins as proof. So that's an interesting way of uh, proving that you've killed 100 people. Don't bother bringing the heads. That's going to be too heavy to carry. Bring the foreskins and we'll count them out and that'll be your dowry. Idea being, David is never going to survive killing 100 of the enemy. So Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well. Notice his innocence. It pleased him well to become the king's son-in-law and the days had not expired. So he had some time left. Great, I'm looking forward to being the king's son. He loves Saul. Therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines, an extra hundred for good measure. And David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full count to the king that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. So that's an interesting scene. They're counting out the 200 foreskins. So here's your hundred plus interest. And um, I'm sure Saul is very, very unhappy. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Isn't that sad? All of the rest of the days, he was his enemy. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. The Philistines were their primary enemy at that time. And so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So his name became highly esteemed. So David just is not doing anything wrong. Now we look at things like killing the Philistines um, and we feel that's harsh and certainly not something we would want to parallel today. But those were different days. Those were different times and we have to enter into the story as to what was going on and that's what he did. And we're going to see that David didn't always do everything right. The key, I think, to understanding David and his relationship with God is basically the key for all of us. You look at someone like Jonathan, and to me, in Scripture, you just can't find much wrong with him. You look at David, and you can find a lot more wrong with him, and a lot of right as well. But the key for David, and the key for us, is David loves God, and David obeys God. When somebody loves God and obeys him, you can't touch him. Oh, you can correct him, you can pray for him, but they belong to God, and you don't mess with that, and you don't judge that. Now, verse uh, 1 of chapter 19. Let's look at this persecution. Jonathan, Saul's son, is going to persuade his father, uh, Saul, not to kill David. 
But Saul tries unsuccessfully to kill him with a spear. And then he's going to send messengers to kill him in his bed. Uh, but his daughter, Michal, is going to help David escape. And Saul's going to send three groups of messengers to take David. But they and even Saul himself are going to be immobilized by God by the power of prophesying. I think the lesson for chapter 19 is no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. And again, he knows that his father is king, but yet Jonathan really loves David. He just has a, a heart for him. He's loyal to him. He's faithful to him. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. So he has a plan to really find out what his father is thinking and to let, Saul, let David know about that. So Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Jonathan is here a picture of an intercessor, somebody who intercedes on behalf of another, goes to somebody who has a, a wrong intent, an evil intent perhaps, and then tries to defend the innocent party. Are we willing to do that? We see all day situations going on and we know that somebody needs to stand up and speak the truth and defend somebody, but are we willing to do it? Reminds me of Jesus, and I think uh, Jonathan becomes here a picture of Jesus because Jesus goes before the Father and he intercedes on your behalf and on mine. As the devil is there to accuse us before the throne of God, it's Jesus who stands up and defends us and says, Father, yes, I know that Jerry is a sinner, but I have died for his sins. I've shed my blood for his sins, and he has given his heart and his life to me. He's trusting in me. Therefore, Lord, I have already carried his sins. Give him the righteousness that is mine. That's intercession. And here is beautiful intercession on Jonathan's part. So, verse 6, Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. So we see almost two personalities here, don't we, with Saul. And that's the way it is when we are subject to a troubling spirit. Right now, Saul is in his normal mind, and no problem with David, let's let him go. But that distressing spirit comes upon him, and then he has rage, and we've all gone through situations like that. We can be normal towards somebody, and then something happens, and we just see red, and we end up being totally and completely out of line. So right now, he's in a good mood. He shall not be killed. Verse 7, Jonathan called David, and Jonathan said, um, they told him these things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul as he was in his presence in times past. So all was made up. Everything's fine. Verse 8, and there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence. He drove the spear into the wall. David fled and escaped that night. Imagine how David feels. David knows that God has called him to be the king over Israel, to replace Saul. And yet, will he even be alive the next day, much less become king? This was a very difficult time for him. A time of trial for days and weeks and months and years. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. 
So Saul was counting on his daughter to side with him, but the daughter loved David and was protecting David. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for his head, and covered it with clothes, as if to pretend that David was still in bed. So the messengers came, and uh, she said, he's sick. Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, bring him up in the bed that I may kill him. When the messengers had come, there was the image of his bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. And Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michal answered, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Now, verse 18, we're going to see David fleeing. He's going to go to Samuel, who's the only really godly man that he can go to at that time, the man who actually anointed him to be king. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is at Naoth and Ramah. So he sent messengers to take David. When they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Notice the power of God there that even the enemies can be overcome by God's power. When Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers a third time, and they prophesied. So he also went to Ramah and came to the great well, and he asked, where are Samuel and David? And they said, at Naoth. So he went. And the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. He stripped off his clothes, prophesied before Samuel in like manner, lay down naked all that day and all that night. And people began to say, is Saul also among the prophets? So we see here clearly uh, what Isaiah tells us, that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. When you're doing God's work, as David is doing, then you're protected. You're not going to have to worry. Now, we shouldn't be foolish, but the work of the Lord can be dangerous at times, but we still have to trust God that what he has told us to do is also his protection for us. We think about some of the folks in our uh, prayer team who are in some dangerous areas, one couple in particular in uh, probably, I would say, the most dangerous uh, country in the world at this time for... uh, uh, white missionaries. It's, uh, it's a totally Islamic country. Uh, their predecessors were murdered right in their homes. Uh, this couple has been told they're being watched, they're being observed. Um, they teach students and they don't even know if the students talking to them are uh, going to go back to the authorities uh, and talk about that. It's against the law to talk about Jesus. It's against the law to be um, proselytizing, to con- convert. Uh, If you're lucky when you're caught, you are exported. If you're not lucky, like their predecessors, you're murdered. This couple is about 62 years of age. Kids, grandkids. Why are they doing this? What is motivating them to do that? They probably ask themselves that daily as well. But it's God who has called them, and they're trusting in Him. They're being wise, they're doing what they can, but they're still, one by one, sharing their faith and their love on behalf of Jesus Christ. And so we have another couple in another country, uh, almost as dangerous uh, in Africa, and um, again, doing the work of the Lord. Uh, So there are people all over who are in dangerous situations. But when God has called you, he'll protect you. I love the saying, when God guides, God provides. So David's protected because God has bigger plans for him than to be killed by Saul. Chapter 20. David now is going to seek to know why Saul wants to kill him. And is there a chance for reconciliation? Jonathan's going to determine Saul's attitude and then communicate to David. They're going to vow loyalty to each other. And Jonathan learns that Saul is determined to kill David. So Jonathan warns David he's going to have to flee. Again, I think Jonathan is the key player here. And he shows us from Proverbs that a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born 
for adversity. Pray that you can be a Jonathan to somebody. Pray for a Jonathan to be there for you. I hope you have one because there are very few Jonathans in this world, very few. Chapter 20, let's look at Jonathan's loyalty toward David. Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah. He went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? So Jonathan said to him, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. So Jonathan is not being deceptive. He's pure. He's innocent. He cannot believe that his father would want to kill David after all that David has done for Saul, killing Goliath, ministering in music, being a military leader. And Jonathan thinks that the love that he has for David must also be there in his father's heart. He's innocent, he's naive, but he means well. David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes, and he has said so. Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but one step between me and death. David knows that he's on a very, very slippery slope at this time. He's just a step away from death. So Jonathan said to David, Whatever you desire, I will do for you. And David said to Jonathan, Indeed, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat, but let me go that I might hide in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he says thus, it's well, your servant will be safe. But if he is very angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant with the Lord, Uh, of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, if there's iniquity in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? So I'm going to be hiding in the field. I'm not going to sit at Saul's table, make up this story about my going to Bethlehem to a feast. If he understands and says, all right, let it go, then I'm good. But if Saul is angry and wants to kill me, then I know his heart toward me. So, verse 9, Jonathan said, Far be it from you, if I know certainly that evil is determined by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you? So David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me, or what if your father answers you roughly? So how am I going to know? And Jonathan said to David, Come, let's go out into the field. So both of them went out into the field. And Jonathan said to David, The Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is a good There is good toward David, and I do not send to you and tell you. May the Lord do so and much more to me. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I'll report it to you and send you away that you may go in safely. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. So I'll find out what my father thinks, and I will let you know. So help me God. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. So Jonathan is loyal, and he is saying to David, you be loyal to me as well and to my offspring. And if I die, make sure that my children are under your protection as well. And that will come to pass. Jonathan will die in the near future at the hands of the Philistines along with Saul. And when David becomes king, he will ask if there are any heirs of Jonathan. And there is a poor, unfortunate man who is lame, who as a baby was dropped by the nurse when she was fleeing the enemy. And he can't really walk. and He can't take care of himself. And he's rather an unfortunate creature His name is Ephibosheth, and David is going to show compassion and care and have this young man eat at his own table. So these two men are honorable, and they will protect one another, Jonathan and David. Verse 17, now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him. 
for he loved him as he loved his own soul. You don't see that too much, do you? Loving somebody as you love your own soul. Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you'll be missed, because your seat will be empty. When you have stayed three days, go down quickly, come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed, and remain by the stone, Izel. So here's the plan. Stay away three days, don't come to Dad's table. Let's see what Dad's attitude is going to be. And I'll come out here, and I'm going to let you know, through a certain sign, my father's attitude towards you. Verse 20, I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target. And there I will send a lad saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you. Get them and come. Then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. But if I say thus to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you. Go your way for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, Indeed, the Lord be between you and me forever. So here's the deal. You stay out there in the field for three days. I'll come out with a young man, and I'll be doing some archery practice. And uh, if I tell the young man to start running and say to the young man, oh, the arrows are on this side of you, a little bit short of you, come on back and get them, then my father is fine toward you. But if, on the other hand, I say, no, young man, the arrows are further out, then my father wants to kill you. So that's going to be the sign that David knows. And again, we have a covenant forever. Let's remember that and always be faithful to each other. And again, value those who are true friends. How many people can you count on one hand or two that are so faithful and loyal to you that they will be there for you through thick and through thin? Uh, they'll be there whether it's to their harm or not. Those kinds of people are very, very hard to find. Verse 24, David hid in the field. When the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. The king sat on his seat, as at other times, on a seat by the wall. That tells you everything about Saul right there. Where is he sitting? With his back against the wall. Remember those cowboy movies? When the guy knows that they're after him and he's playing poker or having a drink or what have you, he gets his back to the wall, right? So that nobody can be behind him. That's somebody who doesn't trust anybody. And that's who this man Saul is. So he's there and Jonathan uh, is seated opposite him. And Jonathan arose or was actually seated opposite his dad. Abner uh, sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day. For he thought something has happened to him, he's unclean, surely he's unclean, meaning he's touched a dead body or done something else, and so ceremonially he has to go through a cleansing. It happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan his son, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, either yesterday or today? Son of Jesse, doesn't call him David, does he? Kind of an indication there of the distance that Saul has in his heart between him and David. Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city. My brother has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore he has not come to the king's table. Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. He said to him, you son of a perverse rebellious woman, Modern translation, living translation, you son of a whore. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. Now therefore ascend and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? Notice that intercession. His father is angry, he knows his father, and yet he is willing to take one more step for his friend David, even at the peril of his own life. He knows his father, he knows how his father has a spear always in his hand, and yet he still will, at the peril of his own life, stand up for his friend. Lord, send a Jonathan to me, is my prayer daily, and I'm sure yours as well. Well, Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. So here's Saul, even in anger, trying to kill his own son. 
because he's standing up for him. The hatred, the jealousy is so strong against David that he cannot even think straight. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger, ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. He wasn't grieved for himself that his father almost killed him. He was grieved for David. What a beautiful man this is. He's so pure. He's thinking about David, not himself, thinking about others and not self. And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the appointed time with David. A little lad was with him. And he said to the lad, now run and find the arrows which I shoot. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out before the lad, is not the arrow beyond you? That was the signal. And Jonathan cried out after the lad, make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, go carry them to the city. So this is the signal. My father wants to kill you. And as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place beyond the south, or toward the south, fell on his face to the ground, bowed down three times, and they kissed one another, and they wept together, but David more so. Notice that bowing down. I don't think that's so much out of friendship as an acknowledgement by David in humility. You, Jonathan, are the king's son. And I think between the two of them, David sees Jonathan as having the higher position, and he bows down to him as if Jonathan one day might become the king. Jonathan, of course, loves David even as his own soul. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. So I see here in chapter 20, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I think of those in my life who have been friends and brothers and sisters who are loyal and faithful, and of course those who have not. We all can say the same thing. I think of Jesus, who is that friend who is closer than a brother, who is born for adversity, who's always there for us, who understands us when nobody else does. So in this persecution of David, which will go on for pretty much 21 years. You think of a young man called to be king at age 14, but he won't be assuming that role over the whole of the country, Judah first and then Israel, but he won't assume it all for another 21 years. What's that? 24, 34, 35 years of age at least. He's got a long road ahead of him. The calling of God is sure. It's powerful and it will come to pass, but it's not always easy. And so we need to be trusting in the Lord and you can't do that road alone. You need people like Jonathan there to help you. And behind every successful person is a Jonathan or two who helped you to get there. We must never forget that. We must never be uh, too big in our own hearts. And David's not too big in his own heart. He remembers Jonathan. He remembers the offspring, his son Mephibosheth and what have you. So... We're going to be having adversity in our lives, persecution of one sort or another. It can be people. Members of our own families can persecute us. Uh, people at work, in ministry, um, certainly the devil, certainly the demonic spirits. Persecution is all around us. But we need to stay sweet. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and know that if we need help humanly, God's going to bring a Jonathan in our lives. And certainly we need help spiritually he has already given Jesus Christ for our lives. So persecution is for the righteous, but guess what? Persecution is there for the unrighteous as well. It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so even those that are not in the Lord, those that are not in Christ, have their share of persecution. My advice, persecution is guaranteed. Find the Lord the Lord Jesus Christ, and let him be the one who protects you in the midst of that persecution. Don't go through it alone. And talking to those on television and YouTube, wherever you are, or by radio, I urge you, 
These are difficult days and days are getting more difficult ahead. Don't go it alone. Life is tough, but Jesus wants to be there to take you through these difficult times. He has died for your sins. He wants to bring you before the Father in righteousness, clothed in his righteousness, you being cleansed of your sins. And he says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So I urge you to answer his call. Revelation 3 tells us he stands at the door, the door of our hearts, and he knocks. And he says, open the door to me and I'll come in to you and I will dine or fellowship with you and you with me. And when he does that, he'll protect you. I can't guarantee you won't have persecution. In fact, I will guarantee you what Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, guaranteed. That's one prayer I never say, Lord, you promised persecution, please bring it. It's going to be there. It's going to be there. But he says, I will be there. And here's the good news. In this world, you will find tribulation or persecution, but I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. He wants to come into your heart and he wants to show you how to go through these difficult times. If you were on a, sh on a boat and you needed the captain to steer that boat through the shoals and the difficult rocks and what have you, make sure you have an experienced man at the helm or a woman. So it is with Jesus. Life is tough. There are a lot of rocks. There are a lot of problems. But let Jesus take you through it. Not only through it here, but all the way into his Father's kingdom. So with that in mind, let's pray. And for those of you who do not know the Lord, this prayer will include you in your heart. Agree with me and you will find Jesus to be your deliverer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the blessed and powerful name of Jesus Christ. We ask you to forgive us for our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord Jesus, we open our hearts to you. And we ask you to come in and fellowship with us and dine with us and guide us and lead us. Lord, we are suffering persecution or we will suffer it. Show us how in love to keep our eyes on you. You promised that as we are persecuted, that Lord, we are going to have a great reward in heaven. And the great prophets and those who went before us also were persecuted. Help us, Lord, to react the way you tell us to react in love, praying for those who persecute us, loving them and doing good for those who despitefully use us. We see here in this story how David keeps his eyes on you and still loves Saul, never stops loving Saul. Help us not to react adversely to those who are persecuting us. Help us to pray for them, to love them, and perhaps through that to show them the love and the salvation of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. And amen.